How could he, we wonder? How could Peter ever deny that he knew his Lord when just hours before he had been so outspoken in saying that it would never happen? How could he? Jesus said that it was going to take place, said that all of his followers would forsake him that night. But it was Peter among all of them who was most outspoken, most emphatic, that he would never deny his Lord, even if he must go to prison with him, even if he were called upon to die for him. So how could he? It, of course, happened just as our Lord said that it would. Before the cock crowing broke the night, Peter had denied his Lord, had denied his Lord with curses and swearing yet, had denied his Lord not just once, not just twice, but three times. How could he? Well, all of that, of course, was long ago and far away, ancient history. And this is here and this is now. And so the more relevant question for you and for me is, how could we? How could we? For we also, in our own way, have this terrible habit of denying our Lord. It happens to you and to me. We may not do it so boisterously in such outspoken fashion as did Peter, but we do it nonetheless. Our, default, our denial is often by default. Peter was bold and brash. We are very quiet about it. We just say nothing. Now our Lord had told his followers, us as well, that there would be pressures brought to bear upon us. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you, he says in his word. And in his instructions to his disciples before he sends them out on a missionary journey, in Matthew chapter 10, he tells them, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent and doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles, and you will be hated by all because of my name. And of course, it happened. All of the disciples ultimately ended up giving their life for their Lord except for one, the Apostle John. And it has happened throughout the ages of the church's history as well. There has never been a time in the history of the church when Christians, followers of our Lord, have not faced persecution in some way or another. And to their credit, so many of them have stood boldly. I like the story about Polycarp. He was a second generation Christian, a disciple of John the Apostle. He was Bishop of Smyrna. He lived to be 86 years old. And when he was 86 years old, the Roman authorities arrested them, arrested him. The Roman council commanded him to declare Caesar is Lord and to deny Christ. And his response was, for 80 and 6 years I served him, and he did me no harm. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? And so they burned him at the stake. And that story keeps getting repeated throughout the ages, happening now. If you are a Muslim, living in a Muslim country, and you convert to Christ, you face a death penalty. And the only way you're going to get out of that death penalty is if you deny Christ and reconvert to Islam. That's what's going on in our world today. More 
martyrs to the faith that has been said in our lifetime, our generation, than in all of the generations proceeding back to the time of Christ. Could it happen among us in this land, our country, home of the, of the brave and the free? Is it perhaps already beginning to happen? They passed a health care law not that long ago. And as part of that law, if you are a business owner and you are employing more than 50 employees, you are duty-bound to offer abortion services. And if you do not care to be an accessory to the killing of little children in the womb via abortion, you will be fined. You will be fined large fines every day that you do not comply. I read just this morning in the Chicago Tribune, some of you may have seen the little note as well. Down in Florida, there is a university professor who gave his students a classroom assignment. They were to write the name of Jesus on a piece of paper and then put the paper on the floor and stand on it. We are not told how many did not comply. So the pressures are there. And in our society, in our culture, perhaps in a more non-threatening way, a rather innocent-seeming way, but they're just the same. And the problem with you, with me, with us all, is that we have this habit of just going along to get along. We zip our mouths. We don't say a thing. And that, in and of itself, becomes a form of denial. Can't help but be. We're so much like that young boy who was going to go off to work in the North Woods in a rough-and-tumble lumber camp. And he was a committed Christian young boy. And his father warned him, there are some rough people up there. They're not godly people. When they find out you're a Christian, they will be making fun of you. They might make it rough for you. But the boy went off. And after a period of time, he came back. And his father asked him, well, how did it go? And the boy replied, oh, it went fine. I had no trouble whatsoever. And what happened, the father asked, when they found out that you were a Christian? And the boy replied, they never found out. And that's us so often as well. What, you did, what did you do this past weekend? A coworker asks us on a Monday. And we recite all the stuff that happened during the week and weekend and all of the things that we did. Except we don't say, and on Sunday morning, I went to church with my family and worshiped my Lord and Savior. Not the politically correct thing to do, and so we say nothing, which is dangerous, because our Lord has some other things to say in Matthew chapter 10 that are very pointed. He tells us a little farther on in the chapter, everyone therefore who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Serious business. We are called upon to give an answer to the hope that is in us, as the Apostle Peter says. But so often we zip it up and just say nothing. Which is sad, because that becomes another form of denial. Peter denied, but he was very outspoken, very bold and brazen about it. I do not know the man, he said. We say nothing, but the message is just the same. I don't know him. I'm not connected with him. There's nothing more to say, which is sad. Now, our Lord dealt with Peter in a most gracious and wondrous way. And that's how he deals with you and with me as well. 
We know that when Peter denied for the third time the cock crowed, but something else happened, the evangelist Luke tells us in his gospel. Jesus was being transported and passed by that courtyard where Peter was doing his denying. It was probably between the hearings that were held with Jesus before Annas and on the way to the hearing that was going to take place before Caiaphas. But Peter denied, Jesus passes by, and we're told he turned and looked at him. And we don't know what was in that look. Surely there had to be sadness and sorrow on the Lord's heart because of what his supposedly trusted disciple had done. But I'm sure there was also grace and mercy knowing our Lord. Grace and mercy that would and could restore him. And that grace and mercy, that grace and mercy is there for you and for me as well. There was something else that happened just a bit later. It was after our Lord's resurrection. And when the women went to the tomb, Mark tells us in his gospel, and saw that it was empty, the angel announced to them, you seek Jesus of Nazareth. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. And Peter, the angel said that he is going before you into Galilee. The point, of course, is that the resurrection, our Lord's resurrection, and his death for that matter as well, that resurrection was for Peter. And that resurrection is for you and for me as well. To take away our sin, to cure us of our sin sickness, to wash it all away, the denials of which you and I are guilty too. We know that when Peter saw Jesus at Galilee, our Lord asked him three times, because he had had denied three times, Simon, do you love me? And three times Peter had the opportunity to say, yes, Lord, yes, you know that I love you. And then our Lord told him, feed my lambs, feed my sheep reinstalled him as a disciple and a follower of his, accepted him as his very own. And there was something else that happened to Peter as well that we participate in also. That very night he betrayed his Lord, he partook of the supper which our Lord instituted. The supper of his body and blood given under the forms of bread and wine taken from that Passover meal that was celebrated that night. And that was Peter's assurance, your sins are forgiven you. And that is our assurance as well. Your sins are forgiven you. That became very clear as our Lord went from that upper room after celebrating that meal to Calvary where he offered himself up on that cross, poured out his lifeblood there, became very evident that that meal is indeed a forgiveness meal, a life-giving, saving meal. And it's the meal that you and I have opportunity to receive as well, this very night. The message that comes through loudly, clearly in the supper is your sins are forgiven you each and every one of them. And there is something also that happens in the Lord's Supper. And the Apostle Paul speaks of it as he gives us the words of institution when Jesus said, this is my body given for you, this is my blood shed for you. Our Lord added to those words, tells us Paul, by saying, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, You show forth the Lord's death till he comes. You proclaim Jesus by the very fact that you come forward to receive his body and blood. You're telling your brothers and sisters who are gathered here, this Jesus, he is my life. He died for me and he rose again for me and he gives me life. And as you can say it here, by your very presence at the Lord's altar, 
Well, the point, of course, is that it's a message that's meant to be taken out into the streets to the folks out there as well. Jesus is my Savior and Lord and yours as well. May you share that good news as you come forward this night and as you go forward from this night into the world in which our God has placed you. Do not deny, but confess, Jesus is Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.